Tom Stoppard is here. He is a smart and clever dramatist, the Czechoslovakian-born British playwright. is at 57 years old at the very top of his game. Last season, two of his plays were performed by England's most prestigious theater companies, the Royal Shakespeare Company and the National Theater. Indian Inc., his latest work, opened in London in February. Here in New York, the Lincoln Center production of Arcadia opens this week at the Vivian Beaumont, and Hapgood just closed on Sunday after two extensions at the Mitsigena Theater. All of that work from a former journalist and drama critic who captured our attention with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead in 1967, followed by travesties, jumpers, real Inspector Hound, The Real Thing, and many others. He has won three Tony Awards, and we're very pleased to have him here on the eve of the beginning of Arcadia at the Vivian Beaumont at Lincoln Center. Welcome. Thank you. Great to have you here. Uh, we've done this a couple of times, and it's always a pleasure for me. Tell me what Arcadia is about. Well, uh, for one thing, it shuttles between the 20th century and the early 19th century. It all takes it's place in a castle. That in, no, not a castle, I mean, but it, it, it takes place in one in room. room right. In uh, one room in what we call in England the stately right. home, almost the castle. And it's about what happens inside this room and also what happens outside the room in the garden. And uh, I could go on for too long about that, but it, it, it's about um, romance and mathematics and landscape gardening and Byron, how's that? All right. How did it begin for you, this idea for this play? I'm fascinated by the process of how what comes out of your head and makes its way into the uh, mouths of actors. Well, theater is a double event. It's a, it's a text and it's an event. It's a happening. Mm. And uh, quite often, uh, the ori origins of a play um, they, co they come from two different places accordingly. I like the idea of, of, of a play in which uh, the action switched uh, periods, perhaps by 100 years, 200 years, but the, but the room stayed exactly the same. That, so that, if you like, is a, is a sort of mechanistic idea. Yeah. It's a theatrical happening idea. The subject matter of the play really derives from an interest in the way we use terms like classical and romantic. We tend to divide um, even people and temperaments right, into right. the classical type, the romantic type. And um, as you know, in, in, the, in the history of uh, our culture, in poetry, in gardening styles, in painting, in all kinds of areas, there's something deemed to be classical and something deemed to be romantic think of architecture. Right. Um, these don't divide so neatly. I think the one partakes of the other. And um, that's all I had to start with, abstract as it sounds. That's what I kicked off with. And so you sit down and do what? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, theater is a storytelling art form, and it really, really is. Years and years ago, I was in Iran. It was so long ago, it was called Persia. And I wandered out of the hotel and saw a crowd of people in the corner of the garden. And it turned out that they were all listening to one man telling a story. And uh, this was theater. There was this tiny theater happening, a monologue. I think that and I think this much more this year than 25 years ago, much more this year than the last time we met, which wasn't that long ago. I think that the, the narrative interest of this strange event is, not, is paramount. That's what I feel now. When I was a young man and full of confidence and didn't have all my present insecurities, um, I, I was confident enough to believe that if I, if I just juggled things around and put spangles on them, mm -hmm. the whole thing would be really interesting and entertaining for two, two and a half hours. And sometimes I got away with it. You could now, be clever with language and get away with it. You know, pastiche, parody, right. jokes, music, song, dance, intellectual, ping pong, Gymnastics, all that yeah. stuff. Um, it wasn't a calculation, Charlie. It was just what I liked. You, you have to write what you like in the yeah. year in which you write it. And um, now I, I want, want to find good stories to tell, which, which is why I'm not very prolific, but I hope to be more prolific. Yeah, but I mean, so then you're saying Arcadia, because of its narrative, because of its storytelling, is a takeoff for you. It's a different place for you as a playwright. It's not a complete break, but I think that the reason Arcadia has worked so well, touch wood, elsewhere, yeah. which I, and which, uh, significantly I would include in foreign languages. I mean, this actually gets us to the nub of it. My stuff was quite hard to translate. Mm -hmm. um, Arcadia has now been done in, in more countries more quickly than any other play I wrote. 
And I think it's because it works on a de detective story level, quite yeah. apart from all these grand things you and I have been talking about yeah. just now. But uh, the, the no why did you, you decided that you felt like it was necessary to, to take off with the narrative form, to explore these ideas? Because everybody, when they talk about you, always says Stoppard is writing about ideas. And they will look at all the things that you have done, most of them, and say this was an exploration of this idea. Whether it's Hapgood and people talking about dual personalities and perceptions with spies as a metaphor or whatever it is. No, that's still true. I, I do get um, stimulated, turned on, as we say, yeah. by ideas. But um, you can't begin until you've got some kind of structure, situation, dramatic narrative. Context, yeah. Story, yeah. the simplest word is best. And um, what I mean is that in the past, I, I just made do, I think, sometimes with a story. If, if, I, if I was lucky, I found one which worked reasonably well. With Arca Arcadia, um, I found I sort of fell into one, stumbled into one, and fumbled my way through one, which when I look back, really did work much better than I realized it was going to. And it alerted me to this perfectly obvious fact <laughs> that yeah. if, if the story works on, on a very simple narrative level of you know, what yeah. happened next and what's going to happen, then you are in a much stronger position to indulge yourself, if that's the phrase I'm looking for, uh, with all these interesting ideas which uh, f fuel you mm -hmm. to fill 100 pages with your writing. I have always assumed about you that, this is more a question about writing plays versus other art forms, is that you wrote plays because it was the best place for you to express the kinds of ideas, to debate in your own head through your yes. own characters, ideas that you were curious about, yes. right? Well, you know, a duologue is a perfect form for yeah. in which to conduct a dispute. Yeah. A dialogue is the best way to conduct a dispute or conflict of ideas. Dialogue is the best way to contradict yourself. Yeah. You can write <laughs> <Right>. both, <laughs> yeah. both parts, yeah, right, right. Um, which I found uh, pretty useful because most of the time I didn't really know what I think until I've written the dialogue. And uh, yeah. then somebody can come up and overturn the apple cart as well. But yes, um, I didn't have to write plays. Um, uh, there were, you know, the idea of writing novels might be attractive. I did write one many years ago. I stuck with theatre. Um, and I've never really turned around to, to ask myself, you know, why I made that choice. Part of it is um, just the fun of it. Yeah. Uh, it's a team sport. I really have a good time. You like the whole business of it? I do. The rehearsal, I, the, the, I do, the staging, you know. the sets, the... And I, love, I like working with actors. Um, there's, it's a, there are two stages to this. Uh, while, while I'm writing a play, I'm very private and very reclusive, really, and, and bad-tempered and absent-minded and all that, and I wouldn't dream of discussing it with anybody. When it's done, and there it is on the table, and there's all the actors sitting around the yeah. table and the director, yeah. um, then when it's, when, oh, I, there's, there's a phrase I never heard in my life until we were rehearsing Hapgood, and I, I love it so much. We don't, we don't use it in England because we're too polite. It's when the meat gets to its feet. And, the <laughs> <laughs> and, and so as, as... When the meat gets to its feet. Well, one day the director of Hapgood, Jack O'Brien, yeah. said something about, let's get the meat on its feet. And I <laughs> realized he meant we have to get up and start acting. Yeah. Um, but there's a point where um, uh, it's no longer enough to call it a text. Yeah. Uh, it's turning into an event. And then um, the, my other persona, which is somewhat, uh, as I say, reclusive and, and, and tight. Then and it protective has to, almost and pr until it comes out. Very good. That's what it is, protective. Then you have to lose some of that and get in amongst the, the dialogue with the actors. And even in the latter stages, uh, in London, I've got a play which opened about three weeks ago. I was sort of changing things around. Is this Indian Ink? Or yeah, Indian yeah. Ink. To, s to fit in with the set design. You know, when things flying yeah. take so much time. And I like, I, like, I like the way theatre is practical and pragmatic, and it's a concrete problem, not just an airy, fairy, mm -hmm. and fine art form. Yeah, but the reason I ask the question, I hear all of that and, and understand that, but if you fall in love with narrative, might you then say, well, maybe I can translate this best in a novel? 
Well, there's some, this novel certainly, may lead itself to storytelling better than. Well, there, um, look, there's nothing like it, is there? It's very, it's a dangerous sport. Uh, you can think of it as a novel, if you like. But all the readers are in in one room at the same time reading yeah. it, and you have to listen to their reaction. Uh, the advantages, you know, the safe area is that they all get exactly the same thing, whichever night you give them the book. Yeah, theatre cannot be like that, will never be like that. And uh, we go through this slightly silly thing uh, right now in these final previews where, yeah. you know, there's on a given night, a given critic is out front. And, you, and, and there's, there's 10,000 moments which turn into this three-hour play. And you become kind of stupid about, oh dear, what about moment 617? It wasn't quite as good as Tuesday night, was it? You, you become slightly crazy. Um, but the same text, unfortunately, or oh, fortunately, uh, as you know from the plays of William Shakespeare, this, the, a given text can give rise to an evening which you'll remember with delight for yeah. years and years, yeah. and an evening which you would like to forget immediately right. because it didn't work. Same text. So theatre is complicated, and um, that's one reason why I like it. When you put it together and, and, and you'll go through this process. Uh, do you care, uh, do, you, do you care, or how much do you do to, you've said before that, that art is recreation, yes. right? You believe that. You I believe that your responsibility is to provide recreation for that, those people who pay for those tickets and come and sit there to be entertained. Yes, what I believe firmly is that, is that, that, uh, Art is, is ten different things. Um, it's not nine. You can't leave recreation out of it. Yeah. And therefore, what do you do to make sure you're entertaining? What's the demand on you and what... Well, that's a good one, isn't it? Um, what can I say? There is a match each time between a play and an audience. If the match is reasonably a good match, uh, then it doesn't, you know, there is no one answer because um, in a given space, given audience, um, the idea of um, a completely absorbing recreation might be one of the drier plays of Ionesco, Arnold Bennett, um, Samuel Beckett. Arnold Bennett? <laughs> <laughs> Take 43. <laughs> um, um, at the same time, you know, um, I, I, I love stand-up comics. I love circuses, yeah. um, I I, as well as uh, rather rather dry, quiet. So when plays. they talk about you as the intellectual playwright, yeah. uh, do you want you sh shirk from that, and do you want to yeah. say, I don't want that label. Take it somewhere else because it doesn't fit where I think I am or what I think I'm about. Well, I think it's a pity that theatre, um, you know, has such a low estimation of itself that a play which just touches upon what you might call intellectual subjects instantly uh, means that the, the, the writer is a, has, a, has the intellectual label attached to him. Let's, let's, be, let's, you know, let's be realistic here. My intellectual plays, God bless them, have made no original contribution to intellectual thought. All it means is that that um, the you know my subject matter includes, um, if you like, intellectual preoccupations. But even that phrase uh, leaves out the fun, doesn't it? Well, but suppose then someone says it includes intellectual games, in which in yes. the end there's no resolution. Do you care if they make that criticism? Yes, I do, um, because that's not my intention. Um, Theatre uh, has a form. It, it has a form. A play ha has a form as inescapably and as necessarily as architecture has a form. You, you simply can't just, uh, you know, build, f just, just build for two hours and 40 minutes and then stop halfway through this turret. I mean, theatre also has an architectural form, and, and the writer is attempting to make it into this form. Um, if, if uh, you walk out of it at the end saying, well, that was quite intriguing, quite mm -hmm. recreational, whatever, God, it didn't seem to get anywhere or say anything, then 
then I've got it wrong. Yeah, but that's not my point, though. It's not where it, it could get somewhere, but it didn't necessarily resolve itself. I mean, you you engaged in this sort of intellectual dialogue with yes. with uh, uh, ideas clashing with each other, but you didn't come away, in a sense, with a resolution to the conflict. I'd mind that, too. I think. But life doesn't have resolution to conflicts about ideas, does it? I mean, there no. is not necessarily one answer to a lot of these debates that you seemed interested in. And if you explore the sort of the relationship between science and art and a lot of other things, yes. I'm not sure that there's an answer at the end of the day. Well, uh, theater aims towards the denouement very often. And uh, as you say, life very often doesn't provide one. Yeah. On the other hand, the theater be supposed to because that's the nature of the beast. It's the nature of the beast. Um, I think that... That's why um, we have three acts. That's why we have rising action, falling action, denouement, and all of that. But isn't that true of music and painting? Um, a, a, an artist doesn't, you know, paint a canvas, and then you, you don't go in and say, I think I'd like a yard and a half, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not... That's, that, that would say the form doesn't matter. Um, Life doesn't have form and denouement, but then on the other hand, you know, we're not asking to pay $42 to go and sit and look at life. Yeah. It's only to do it for theater. Speaking of that, uh, you were at, the, uh, at, Canada, at Lincoln Center. Yes. You, would you want to be on Broadway? Would you want to take that risk, say, with Arcadia? With Arcadia? Well, three or four producers did ask me to take that risk. I say take that risk. They were assuring me there was no risk at all. I mean, because they could sell it out for six months or a year. Because or they were orders and all that. <laughs> because they were producers. <laughs> they say metier. <laughs> yes, that's it. Um, to sell playwrights on the idea. Yeah. And and um, I I'll tell you, I, I think that that um, I got to the point where I wanted to have a, a four or five month success rather than a 10, 11 month failure. I, I just like the idea of being in a theater with, where the commercial pressures didn't exist in, in the same form. Lincoln Center is a, it's a unique place in, in, in New York City, yeah. in the American theater indeed. Um, I have friends who've worked there. I, I, I knew of it and I knew it first and second hand as being a, a very um, sympathetic yeah. place for a writer to be. and. Um, I like I like being there. Um, it ha there's a good side and there's always a downside to everything. Um, I personally like theatres with proscenium arches. What's the downside then? Well, it's not a downside, but but Lincoln Wider Center's audience, more money or what? What's the downside of what? Uh, of, I'm, well, go ahead. I mean, you said there's an upside and a downside. Well, I'm telling you. Okay. I'm, I'm the I, 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 this is this, it's not it's not a downside. It's just a fact of life. Um, uh, I tend to write for the proscenium arch, which is a picture frame theater. Mm -hmm. It's because everything I write turns out to have to work one way or another on some comic level or another. Mm -hmm. uh, when you write comedy, it's very tough if, uh, if uh, not everybody in the audience has got exactly the same view. So it's a challenge and a problem, which Trevor Nunn and the company have, in fact, solved very successfully in the case of Arcadia. Trevor Nunn being your director. He's the director of Arcadia. Uh, and um, I wouldn't have chosen um, to be on, in an amphitheater with a wraparound audience and an apron stage. Now that it's happened and I've seen it, I'm pleased. But I was nervous, I must admit, because I subconsciously always see this picture frame when I'm writing and you know, these little figures are moving around yeah, yeah. and there's only one view of the show um, and that's not true in b many modern theaters. As you find yourself growing older, you're 57 now, uh, do, you, do you find yourself more, more, more oriented to risk, more oriented to new directions as this is, as you said, in terms of his narrative form or less so or less willing to uh, uh, take chances. <clears throat> More fret of failure, less fret of failure. Fearful. Uh, from from inside here, nothing changes. Um, when I when I look at my plays uh, over the last twenty five years and more, or when somebody else might look at them, you could say, oh, you know, more risk, less risk, the change of this, change of that. But uh, that's not a subjective view in any way. Uh, you, you, Plays are the people who write them, and I've always written plays for the only reason that it's possible to write anything, that suddenly 
yes, you know, God, I can do this one. Um, oh, thank Christ, I've got one more to do. Because I've got nothing in the bottom drawer. I don't have a bottom drawer. I have no cupboard. When I write a play, that's it. I'm finished, out. I have nothing left to do. So, and how does it feel when you finish? Well, when I finish, it feels wonderful for about three days. And then I think, well, I'm not working. I've got nothing to do. What am I going to do? I don't have a play to write, and so forth. So if, an, if, if the subject matter looms into view like some kind of strange fish in an aquarium, and you think, oh, my goodness, yes, I could do a play about that, you certainly don't turn around and say, well, I don't know, is this, what is this, how would this look in the context of my my track record or yeah. whatever or where should I be going you don't think anything like that you, you just, just think I oh, do it just thank goodness thank goodness and how I, many of uh, those ideas do you have swirling around now in other words I've uh, got it, one one I have had it for a year and a half I tried to write it for about three months this time last year um, it's something which interests me a lot I'm not going to tell you what it is because I wh wh you know what's the point I may never do it but I couldn't find, this is where we came in, I couldn't find a narrative structure for, to, to, to convey and conduct and contain uh, the idea. And when I go back to England, which I'll be doing at the weekend, uh, that's going to be, you know, the, almost the first thing I'll do is to go back to that. To find? Storytelling. Mm. It's what we were talking about a few minutes ago. A way to tell the story. Uh, no, to find a story to tell. Well, what do you have? It's really hard to talk about without, without blowing it. All right. but what it, I have let me is just a, be clear yeah. there. This is not. Mm. I read mm. once somewhere that there are I, that you know you were fascinated by the idea of the tabloidization. It's not that of our society. No, um, but uh, no, it's not that. In okay, fact. Um, but that is something that interests you mm -hmm. maybe down the road too. Another play about newspapers, yeah. perhaps. Yes, right. it okay. does. Okay, but go ahead. Anyway, you can't tell me what it is because you don't want to give it away. But you, well, you I don't mean it's such a great idea. Somebody no. else might steal it. What I, I just find embarrassing to, because I, it's like bad manners to 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 announce plays which aren't started and may never be finished. Um, it's a play. I'm interested in in the um, Roman poets of the Augustan age, uh, Julius Caesar time. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how to write for people in togas and may not ever do it. Why, why not? I mean, why would you not know how to write about people in I togas? Don't know, I don't know how to make them talk. Um, and how will you find that out? How will you? Well, uh, you get to learn a trick, perhaps. Um, you know, I once wrote a play which had among its characters James Joyce, not to mention Lenin, not to mention the Dadaist Tristan Zara. And you found out they were in the same city at the same time in 1918. Exactly so. But I didn't know how to write for any of those three voices. Um, so you, you kind of sit there and hold your head. And after a while, you end up writing a play about an old man who was there as well and is telling you the story. But he's a senile amnesiac, so yeah. the playwright is off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> and the same thing, was that true also about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Rosencrantz and Guildenstern was, was a different sort of problem. Um, I wrote a I wrote a play about two characters in Hamlet who spoke what I wrote for them to speak and occasionally um, entered into conversation written by William Shakespeare. Um, I was so um, blithe and, you know, blissfully unaware <laughs> of, of how uh, dangerously arrogant uh, this policy of mine might be. It never occurred to me that my dialogue would be judged against Shakespeare's when the, yeah. if the play were ever performed. And if that thought had crossed my mind, I would never have <laughs> thought of writing such a play. But luckily what happened was that um, it turned out not to look remotely conceited. It turned out to be a sort of um, expression of something which, when you think back about it, is true for all of us, that we have a public mode of address and a private mode of address. And uh, you know, we're not now speaking, we're, we're, we're speaking slightly more syntactically and sustaining formalism in yeah. these conversations. Right, right. And I'm, I'm actually fascinated than, by that notion, but go ahead. Then we were in the green room right. three minutes before we came right, to this right. table. Uh, 
the language structure was quite different. Now, how is it different? I mean, what we're saying, because I've, I've thought about this before, and you have more insight to it than I do. It is that this conversation is how different than if you and I would leave here and have dinner. Uh, give me one example. When we walked in, we sat down. Yes. I said to you, what do you think of the O.J. Simpson business? Are yeah. you interested in it? And you said, of course, but there's so much stuff there, it's hard to keep your eye. Yes. There's so much information around. Yes. That was a natural conversation. Yes, it was. This is a kind of elevated conversation yes. because of television. Half performance, half conversation, half. Yes. The thing is that... I'm always thinking about other things. Organization, I'm thinking about structure, I'm thinking about a lot of other things, in addition to letting myself go into the conversation. Well, the main thing you're thinking about is yeah, that listening. it's not just the two of us. Yeah, exactly. And when it is just the two of us, you and I can rely on talking in code. We can finish each, each other's thoughts. Right, right, you know, we've right. met before. We, we share currency of reference and so on. So we can actually maintain quite a, quite a sustained com conversation without, without really completing a sentence and having a mm. subject, verb, object sentence at all. Um, as soon as we become aware that we're really speaking for the benefit of a third party, you know, that's some, the, these arcs are intersecting out there in the right. blackness. Uh, we realize that we can no longer rely on other people um, being sympathetic to our rather informal way of not completing thoughts, um, not looking for the word, and so on. Um, we can even pause. It's your turn. <laughs> See, uh, actually, that you can use that too. I mean, the, the notion of you can. I sometimes will pause to say it's your turn uh, in order to generate what I think may be a more natural reaction. Yes. From you. Well, <clears throat> I I think that that there is uh, an internal contradiction in the writer interviewed. I I think that. Writers and talkers uh, are two different kinds of animal, and uh, I never, I never feel um, that talking about the work is a natural extension of the work. Of the work, it's a, it's a, quite an interesting mm. uh, hobby or or courtesy perhaps, but it's it's certainly not necessary to it, and possibly slightly corrupting. Um, there's something healthy about protecting yourself from any sort of self-awareness, uh, let alone self-analysis. Um, I don't believe in automatic writing at all. What's, what's automatic writing? Automatic writing is, is uh, uh, it, it's a fad which has passed, but there's a certain, there's a certain uh, possibility of subconscious creative writing where you're really not trying to think. You're, you're writing in a trance, for example, um, or the, you know, as Tristan Zara would draw words out of a hat and writing by chance and fate and coincidence and so on. I think that, that writing um, art, and uh, I'm a very conservative person when it comes to my views on art, I think art um, is essentially a, a, a formal attempt to um, bring some order uh, out of the universe into another medium. Um, so I do feel that, um, that the subconscious uh, has to be the slave of the conscious, of one's consciousness. But at the same time, um, when I say I am slightly fearful of analyzing my own work, analyzing my own instincts, my, my principles, if I have any, that kind of self-awareness, when I say I'm nervous of it, it's because I think that all artists are in some sense the beneficiary of their subconscious. And you have to, you, you, you have to not know too much about what's going on. Doesn't that sound pretentious? No, it doesn't. I mean, I think I hear you. I just hope that not many people, but I, mean, I want you this to still only be a passing notion with you, only because uh, of what my curiosity and what I do is, which is I want you to feel not that. I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's either pretentious to say, look, what I have is my subconscious, which drives what I do, I, if I hear you. My subconscious drives what I do in part, and I best protect it 
uh, I best met, nurture and protect it because it is in the end, if work is central to my life, yes. it is the essence of you what I am. You can't plan an interview too much. Right. Then but I don't. I don't, no, exactly. as you know. But, but. Exactly. I mean, it's the same, it's the same expression. You, you, you can't um, pre-calculate, pre-meditate uh, too far too, in too much detail because then the mom there's no give in it. You see, the moment you go off it, it just breaks like a breadstick. Um, no, no, I don't think that's true. The mo if, if you, oh, if you plan it, then, the, oh, no, I agree with you. Yeah. If, if, you're, if you are, you know, if you're a rigid adherent to a mm. structure, and if it goes mm. away from the structure, then you lose yourself, mm. and you have nowhere to go, and you don't know how to scramble back, I think. If, it, it therefore also loses spontaneity and loses any real sense mm. of... of uh, I, th I think that the best way to come out of a piece of work is the, the times few in number, where you look back and you think, well, I don't know how I did that. That's, that's, that's better than I know how to do. You can actually, that, that, you know, th I'm t this is a great story, which you, everybody in London's heard a hundred times. It is a little bit about Olivier when Roddy McDowell or somebody went back to him and they just seen him and they said, my God, Larry, as I guess he was called, that was, that was incredible. You know, and they thought he would be up and thrilled and knowing how magnificent his performance was. Yeah. And he said, he was almost despondent. Mm. And he said, I know, but I don't know why. I don't know how. Oh, I don't yeah. know how it was that I made it, that mm. it came out. That's part of what you're saying, isn't it? It is, yes. You yes. Know, you don't? Yes, that is, that, that's right. Um, I didn't know that story, but, but it's, it's, it's how actors are. Yeah, yeah, but how about writers? I mean, you, you now look at your work and know that you grabbed something and ran with it and it started a life of its own. And you, all of a sudden, once you were in the process, once you were writing, you were reaching for conversations, there were part notes. I mean, the story is about you that you'll just go buy books and there'll be an idea laying in one book or another book or well, another book. And that somehow, once you get going, your characters say things and do things and feel things that are part of a curiosity that you had that. Yes. And you don't quite know why they reach for that or reach for that. It just happens. A am I putting too much into it? No, you're not. I mean, w when I suddenly became nervous of sounding pretentious about, <laughs> about the subconscious <laughs> yeah. uh, part of writing, um, um, I shouldn't apologize for it. it, whether it's pretentious or not. It just happens to be true, and that's that. When, when one is in the middle of doing it, when one is uh, not talking about writing or rehearsing or thinking that I'll start at six right. o'clock. When one is doing nothing but sitting there with a pen in the hand and a pe paper on the table and doing it, take my word for it, um, there's something going on which um, is not possible to explain rationally completely. Uh, because you, you don't know what the play is you're going to write. And time and time and time again, as you, as you work your way forward, you encounter pieces of such extraordinary luck, happy coincidence. Oh my goodness, that, that's just, yeah, oh right, yeah, right. I see now. Yeah. All that thing. Yeah. Um, and and, and if, they, if, if your luck holds, I don't know if luck is the right word, but if your luck holds, when you get to the end, you think you, you've got something and another person would say, but you couldn't possibly have written that unless you'd planned it all because it just, how would, you wouldn't write this if you didn't know about that. But the, the simple truth is you did write this without knowing about that. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to it, it all goes click. Now here's my last I'm question. I'm not saying it happens every time. Yeah. But my last question is, do you know that it will always come? No, you do not. And, and it puts a great strain on, on one's relationship with one's nearest and dearest because you're so terrified of losing it. I mean, I go to bed worrying about it, wake up with it. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't like really to say good morning much because I don't have time. I haven't got space for that. Um, when I'm too tired to work, then I can join the human race again. Um, but the answer is you're frightened of losing it all the time. Stoppered in the act of creating is a pain in the butt. I'm not 
the most most uh, congenial <laughs> company. No, no. I'm it's, it's great to have you here. I'm out of time. Thank you for coming. Uh, Arcadia opens on Thursday night mm -hmm. here in Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, then you're off in London for the weekend to struggle with a new idea. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. See you then. <laughs>